Hello and welcome to this tutorial. We're going to talk about distance vector routing protocols. Now you might remember RIP from ICND1. Well, RIP is a distance vector routing protocol and we covered some of the concepts on how RIP works and also how to configure it. And also, we haven't covered it, but you may have come across IGRP. Well, that's another distance vector routing protocol. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the class as a whole. In other words, the common characteristics and features to all distance vector routing protocols. And this will kind of round out our knowledge and understanding of this particular class. Now, the other class of routing protocol is known as link state, and we're going to discuss them in a dedicated tutorial. Let's begin by taking a look at what distance vector actually means. We could rename it distance direction. That might help us understand it a little bit better. For distance, we're really talking about a metric. All routing protocols use a metric in order to uh, provide some, some measurement to the routes that they're advertising and sharing. If you remember with RIP, the metric was the hop count. Vector is just another way of saying a particular direction. In other words, where do I go in order to get to this route? And that's usually the next top router that's listed in the routing information. So if we take an example, and let's use RIP, router A learns about a route from router B. In terms of the distance, the metric used in RIP is the hop count. And then in terms of the vector, the direction, that routing information is going to list a next hop router in order to get to that particular subnet. So here, the next hop would be router B. Okay, so that's all we really mean by distance vector. Next, let's take a look at how a distance vector actually works on a router. So when a router starts up and it's running a distance vector, the very first thing it'll do is populate its own route table with what it already knows. In other words, all of the directly connected subnets that are up and functioning will be added to the route table. So router A, for instance, if the link to the 192.168 subnet, that slash 28, if it's up and working, that gets added to the route table. Likewise, the links between A and B and A and D, if they have IP addresses, let's assume they do, and they're up and functioning, let's also assume that they are, then those directly connected subnets will be added as well. Okay, so each router is going to do this. Let's populate our route table with what we already know. Then once we have some information to share, we need to find people to share it with. We need to find our neighbors. And when we share information with them, then we also get to learn information from them. That's the whole exchange process. A router running a distance vector will often find neighbors by issuing a broadcast message just to contact all possible neighbors. And then once neighbors found, they begin exchanging route information. But there's a, there's a note we need to keep in mind with distance vectors. Specifically, a router running a distance vector will only talk to its directly connected neighbors. So for instance, router C and router B will share route information. And likewise, router B and router A will share route information. However, routers A and C, since they're not directly connected, they will not share information between each other directly. Likewise, routers B and C, they're not going to be able to talk directly with router D. So this is a limitation with distance vectors. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, these advertisements are going to be periodically broadcast to all of the directly connected neighbors. So each routing protocol that is a distance vector, like RIP and IGRP, they'll have different timers specific to themselves which dictate how frequent these updates are sent. But regardless of which one we're talking about, this happens on a regular basis with distance vectors. And the entire routing table is sent to each neighbor. So router A, for instance, is going to send its entire route table to routers B and routers D, let's say every 30 seconds if we're talking about RIP and this happens over and over and over. Now because of this, because a router exchanges the entire route table and it's only done with the directly connected neighbors, there are two implications we need to keep in mind with distance vectors. The first one is each router is going to receive the entire route table from its neighbor. Then the receiving router 
has to be the one in order to figure out if any information has changed since the last update or any, any information has been added. Okay, so the receiving router is the one that's responsible for parsing that routing update. So when router A sends out its update, let's say to router B, router B is going to be the one to have to figure out if anything's new. It's going to do this every 30 seconds. This is not terribly efficient, okay, because the entire table sent each time, and you have to find all the little details that have changed. That's the first implication of just how a distance vector works. The second implication is that because routers only talk to the directly connected neighbors, then they have to rely on those neighbors in order to send that routing information to other routers on the network. And likewise, they have to believe the information that they receive from their directly connected neighbors about the rest of the network that they can't see. Right, so let's say router B learns an update from router A. Well, that router A is going to have information it learned from router D as well. Router B has to trust router A and all the information it's getting because routers B and router D cannot talk to each other directly. Okay, so you have to, you have to believe each other. And you have, there's some trust here. This is often referred to as routing by rumor. You're going to come across that when you talk about distance vectors. And this is what we're talking about. You have to trust your neighbor updates because you cannot see beyond your directly connected neighbors. Okay, so those are some of the general things to keep in mind about the basic functionality of a distance vector. Okay, now let's talk about how a distance vector will prevent a loop from happening on the network. So the first mechanism used is called the invalidation timer. And basically all this is, is it's a timer and it's used to remove entries from the route table if updates stop coming. So let's say router C dies. It has a hardware failure and it completely shuts down. Well, router B is eventually going to stop hearing updates from router C. And it will flag the routes that it learned from router C as bad. And then it's going to go ahead and share that information with router A eventually in one of its updates. So this is known as the invalidation timer. If I, if I don't hear from you in a certain amount of time, I'm going to mark your routes as bad. Now, when I share that new information with my other neighbors, so when router B talks to router A, this is known as route poisoning. And this is what they, they call the process when router B has to tell router A that the routes about from router C, that they're bad. Okay, so the bad route is advertised in the, in the periodic update between router B and router A, but it has a metric that is set to a value which indicates it's bad. That way router A can figure out that this is a bad route. This metric is often uh, a very high value. Sometimes it's called the infinite value. So if you remember in RIP, you can have a maximum hop count of 15. And if any hop count becomes 16, that's known as the infinite value. That means it's a bad route. So when a router sees that, it immediately knows that this is a bad route. Okay, so that process, you're going to hear the term route poisoning. That's what they're talking about, updating routers about bad routes. Unfortunately, even though the routers are going to share this bad route information with each other, the actual process of sending routing updates is inherently flawed with distance vectors. And what I mean is, the actual process itself can introduce instability on the network. So let's look at an example, and we'll use one of the most popular ones. It's called the counting to infinity example. You probably have heard about this. Basically, a router is going to lose a connected route. So let's say router A loses the connection to the 192.168.28. And so in its next regular routing update, it's going to send that information, let's say, to router B. However, at about the same time, router B is going to send its regularly scheduled route update to router A. And because it sends its entire route table, it's going to include that same slash 28, but it's going to mark it as OK. So router A is telling router B this is bad. Router B is telling router A this is good 
And router B doesn't care that it initially learned that information from router A. Remember, with distance vectors, they share their entire route table. So they just say, okay, this is my entire route table. I share it with my directly connected neighbors. They don't put any more thought into it beyond that. So what will happen is router B will learn that, okay, uh, this is now a bad route. But router A is going to learn, hey, this is a good route, and I can get there from router B. In fact, router A has forgotten at this point that this subnet used to be directly connected to it. So this is the problem. And this problem is going to last for a little while because the next round of routing updates, they're both going to exchange the information this time, but then it's going to be reversed. Router A will learn that it's bad, but then router B is going to learn that the route is good and I need to go to router A to get there. This goes back and forth, back and forth. Each time that routing update, the hop count is going to increase by one. So eventually, it'll get to its infinity mark, that value that means it's a bad route, and then both routers will remove it from the route table. In RIP, for instance, that, that value, the hop count would be 16. But until that happens, there's instability on the network. The routing information is constantly changing every 30 seconds. Okay, so that's the problem with uh, accounting to infinity, and uh, this is inherent to the actual routing process. If that were the end of the story, then we really wouldn't have any use for a distance vector. However, there is a mechanism in place in order to combat the accounting to infinity example. And this feature is known as split horizon. And here's how it works. We've seen that the distance, ve distance vectors are, they're pretty simple. If I learn some information from you, it makes no sense for me to turn around in 30 seconds and then tell you about the same information you just told me. You would look at me with a, a strange look. But that's exactly what happened in that last example. With split horizon enabled, there's a very simple rule that all the routers are going to follow. And it is, don't advertise routes back to the router you learned them from. Right? It's a common sense measure. So with split horizon on a router, when router B sends an update to router A, it's not going to send the entire route table this time. Rather, it's going to strip out all of the routes it learned from router A. So this way, the counting to infinity example can't happen because when router A loses the 192.168.28, it sends that update with the bad route over to router B but router B, when it sends its update back to router A, it's not going to include that subnet information this time. Okay? So a very simple measure, split horizon, will combat the counting to infinity. Now this particular type of split horizon is known as just the simple split horizon. There's a much more advanced uh, type of split horizon, and that's called split horizon with poison reverse. Now, split horizon with poison reverse works like this. First, when a route fails, router A, let's say it loses that slash 28 again, it's not going to wait for the periodic update. Rather, it's going to send the poison route information out immediately. This is known as a triggered partial update. It's triggered based on the failure of that network, and it's just a partial update, meaning it's only going to send out information about the poison route, about the slash 28 it's not going to send out its entire route table. So that's the first thing that happens. And when router B, for instance, receives that poison route, it's going to go ahead and send that information over to its neighbors as well. Now, the second thing that happens with split horizon is the actual poison reverse portion of it. And here's how that works. When router B receives the poison route, it's going to do something a bit unexpected. It's going to actually actually suspend that split horizon rule which states if you learn information from somebody don't send it back to them. Well it's going to suspend it but only for the poison route. So here when router A sends the poison route to router B, router B is going to send back that same exact poison route information to router A. It's doing this so that router A gets confirmation that router B did in fact receive that route update and the rest of the network eventually will get that information as well. Okay, so it's just really ensuring that all routers are getting updated. Confirmation is a good thing. The actual sending back of that information from router B to router A, this is the, this is the part that's referred to as the reverse route poisoning.
Okay. Now, router B, when it does that, keep in mind, is not going to send any other information back to router A. So it's not a full uh, routing table update. It's just the poison route, and it's not going to include any other routes it learned from router A, only the poisoned route. So this works pretty good. Unfortunately, Split Horizon has trouble when we look at networks where we have redundant connections. And once we add a redundant connection, Split Horizon doesn't work so well. So then we need to introduce yet another mechanism in order to keep this protocol stable. When we add some redundancy to our network here with a link between router A and C, then Split Horizon isn't as effective because even though router A could send a poison route to B and C, the whole counting to infinity example could still happen between routers B and C. So the new mechanism introduced to address this problem is known as the hold down timer. And these work basically by suppressing any routing updates after a poison route is received. So if our slash 28 fails again, router A sends out the poison route to B and C. Now B and C may still have some older route information that gets sent out at about the same time and they share it with each other. However, with a hold down timer, they're not going to listen to any other updates about the poison route. So what we're doing here is we're giving the network some time to converge. We're giving it time to get that poison route information to everybody and let the old information expire. Now router B and C, they would listen to new updates about the slash 28, but they have to come from the originator of the poison route, which is router A. Anyone else who sends them information about that during the hold down time, they're going to ignore it. Okay, so that's how hold down timers work in order to uh, better stabilize this protocol and prevent the uh, chance of loops from forming. Okay? Okay, congratulations, you've made it to the summary. We have covered a lot of information about distance vectors, and it's all good to know. Commit this to memory, because not only can you use it in a troubleshooting scenario, but you can also use it if you're in a design process, process and you need to evaluate a particular routing protocol. Okay, so we now know that distance vector really is just um, a metric and a direction. That's all we're talking about here. With distance vectors, we only talk to our directly connected neighbors, and we exchange our full route table regularly. Now, we covered some of the tools in place in order to explain how this protocol updates neighbors and hopefully prevents loops from happening. The first one is the invalidation timer, when a source dies. Then we talked about split horizon, the simple example, as well as the split horizon with the reverse route poisoning. Make sure you understand those, okay? And then finally, hold down timers were the last mechanism we introduced in order to complete the distance vector. Okay, so that's it. That is the distance vector routing protocols. Thanks for watching.